Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Harvard Classic Lectures. We are in lecture now 16. This is uh, Paradise Lost book number two. Um, let's just remind ourselves that we have earlier lectures that it makes sense for you to have watched before you specifically study this lecture with me and this book with me, Paradise Lost book two. Um, it might be the case that, for example, you feel like you need to kind of review book two, and so you're just going to jump right into this lecture, and of course that's fine, but please understand we've got some previous comments that have been made that I think are important. Just to remind, um, we made some introductory comments on Milton in earlier lectures. For example, we gave a lecture on Areopagitica and, and Milton's prose work. We gave a lecture on Milton's earlier poetic works, including on his blindness. And then we gave some intro thoughts on Paradise Lost as a text, as a poem to be studied. And then we made some observations about Book 1, uh, and we gave a review. For example, we pointed out that there's kind of two creations in Book 1. Notice at the beginning with the invocation of the muse, we've got Milton who's going to try to do something unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. And uh, then uh, at the end, of course, of Book 1, we have that kind of creation of pandemonium, that palace of the demonic angels who are then going to get together. And at the very conclusion of Book number 2, after Satan and the angels kind of figure out that they've been thrown out of heaven because they've been defeated in this major battle, and now they are going to have to figure out what it is they're going to do. They make their way to the land there, and then they, you know, they build pandemonium. At the very end of book one, then, we are going to already be gesturing towards this uh, uh, discussion, this debate, this council, some have argued it kind of starts to look like a parliamentary debate, maybe um, from uh, Milton's own time. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, and then we're going to get into book uh, number two. We turn now uh, to book two, and I'd love to read, as I said uh, to you before, I'd love to read all of, all of book two to you just out loud and exegete each line as we go. We just don't have the time, and so uh, we've got we've to get right to the heart of the matter. And as I did with book one, I'll go ahead and do again with book two, because I love to read these prose arguments that Milton provided, again, with the republishing of the poem um, at the beginning of, of the second book. I hope that you have your copy of Paradise Lost in front of you, either online or, of course, a hard copy, and let's go to work with it. The second book's argument reads something like this. The consultation begun, Satan debates whether another battle be to be hazarded for the recovery of heaven. Some advise it, others dissuade. A third proposal is preferred, mentioned before by Satan, to search the truth of that prophecy or tradition in heaven concerning another world and another kind of creature, equal or not much inferior to themselves, about this time to be created. Their doubt, who shall be sent on this difficult search, Satan, their chief, undertakes alone the voyage, and I'm just going to pause it for a moment, and we're going to say this more later, but alone, and the notion of being alone, is huge to understanding Paradise Lost and the way we read Paradise Lost, and again, that psychological profile, we sometimes call it, of the creation of Satan himself. The voyage is honored and applauded. The council thus ended, the rest betake them several ways to several employments as their inclinations lead them to entertain the time till Satan return. He passes on his journey to hell gates finds them shut, and who set there to guard them, by whom at length they are, they are opened, and discover to him the great gulf between hell and heaven. With what difficulty he passes through, directed by chaos, the power of that place to the sight of this new world which he sought. So, we will have three main parts of book two. So let's go ahead and get this in our notes, and I call these the three greats of book two. Um, we have, first of all, the great debate. Okay, what to do? What are we going to do? And we've got four demonic voices that are going to make presentation, uh, beginning with Malkin. and we'll get into this in a bit. Then, the great plan. What are we going to do? Well, this is going to be the plan. Satan is going to leave hell, travel upwards. Remember, hell in the topography of Milton is down, just like with Dante. Travel up. He's going to make his way to the gates of hell, where he's going he's gonna to meet some pretty gross stuff. And we're going to say in a bit, this is definitely at this point poetry for grown-ups, and we'll explain kind of why in a little bit. Uh, and then finally, the great, after the great plan has been articulated, 
the great escape, the great journey, the great odyssey. Of course, Milton goes to the gates of hell, and then finally at the very end of, uh, of uh, uh, Paradise Lost 2, he's going to travel towards Earth, creating there's the creation of this bridge. Uh, what is it? ACDC calls it in their famous song, The Highway to Hell. It's amazing in popular culture how Milton finds his way, and most people don't even know that it's Milton. Before we begin, though, our study of uh, book two, and uh, dude, I'm, I'm really happy that you're joining me for this conversation. I am thoroughly convinced that this poetry is some of the most amazing stuff I've ever studied, and I want to share that with you. Um, but before we get into it, I, I will say this out loud. I've been teaching this poem for a long time, and, and I have found that a lot of students will limp through, for lack of a better phrase, the first book, and it kind of blows them away, the first book. Um, it's just too hard, it's too difficult, it takes so much time, I don't really know what I'm reading, it's frustrating. And I gotta say it out loud, I think that this is exactly what Milton wants. He wants you to have to struggle, to have to work, to have to get through the work. It's, it's what we have said in another lecture on what T.S. Eliot does in The Wasteland. It's not easy. But it is rewarding if you'll stick with it. Notice, for example, that in this poem so far, and this is the way it's going to continue for the whole poem, there isn't a lot of action. This is often why I will say this is poetry for grown-ups, and I don't mean that as an insult. I just mean this is poetry for people who have matured in their understanding of what makes great literature. It's like what we said about Beowulf. Go back to those lectures. Remember what I said about Beowulf? There's not a lot of action. I mean, if you take, for example, all of the action sequences only from Beowulf, you can put them in just a few pages, but the Beowulf epic is actually quite a bit longer. What's all that other stuff? The important stuff. Remember what we said, the articulation of the Anglo-Saxon epic code and all of that kind of thing. Those speeches are very important. We're going to see this again. We saw this in the first book. We're going to see this again in the second book. It is fundamentally speech-making, but if you'll think about it, that's really what good drama is always. I mean, we've said this about Hamlet in our lectures on Hamlet, for example. There's not a lot of action in Hamlet, the play. We got a lot of talking. Of course, we're on stage. So what else are you going to do on stage other than have periodic action? You're going to have a lot of talking back and forth. Of course, this can frustrate an immature reader who wants to just be entertained. But if you want to be challenged, then, of course, Paradise Lost is a poem for you in a number of ways. Let me, can I say this out loud, let me help you learn how to read this poem. Now, I realize that a lot of you are reading this poem because it's been assigned to you and you have to do it, but others of you are maybe picking this up because you always heard about it and you're like, I always wanted to read that thing and it's like hard. Let me help you through it. And remember, how do I define learning? The capacity to connect, to relate new information to old information. That's central to me. I want to help you do that. For example, I mean, I'll just give you one example. I could do this over and over again. I'll just give you one example. We studied together Machiavelli's classic, The Prince, that unbelievable Renaissance text that is in many ways the counterpoint to Plato's Republic and his notion of the ideal ruler being a philosopher king. You'll remember what Machiavelli said about the ideal ruler. Remember what he said about the prince? The prince is the speaker, the liar, the prevaricator, the one who can twist language to get what it is that he wants. Sounds a lot like Satan in book one. It's going to sound even more like Satan in book two. Which, of course, again, will also sound like what Plato says in Republic in that declension of state discussion in book eight and nine of Republic when he said that the worst imaginable leader is the tyrant, the demagogue. Why? Because he's a great speaker. He can speak and people will just kind of blindly follow along. Has that ever happened in the history of the world where a, pe a person stood up and spoke and a lot of people just said, yeah, yeah, that's what I want, and followed blindly along? We're going to see that actually at play here in Paradise Lost 2. The key, just to remind, and we've said this already, but we're, we're, we're reviewing. The key is to appreciate Milton's poem from at least these three perspectives that I'm challenging you. One is an amazing work of an epic poem, at level 2B as we call it. Two, to think about the philosophic and the theological implications of a text like this. We're going to ask some difficult questions. We asked some difficult questions in the last lecture. We will ask more in this lecture. For example, watch this one. I'll just point this out, and then we'll get into this. What makes evil evil? 
Go back to our discussion of theodicy in our earlier lecture. Remember we put the theodistic enterprise on the whiteboard with that triangle and we imagined that mother with her dying daughter in a hospital room. The child is dying and you say it's terrible and the mother says it's terrible and the mother says I wish there was an all-powerful, all-loving deity that could save my child. Oh, there is, you, you, were, you were report in this model. There is? Well then, if the God is all-powerful, why is it my daughter cured? It must not be very loving. No, no, all-loving. Well, if the God is all-loving, must not be very powerful. Oh, no, no, also all powerful. Well, then how do you explain for the fact my child is dying of leukemia and it's terrible? The counter response, and we'll pick this up now in book two, is, well, what makes a child dying of anything? We mentioned, for example, the slaughter of children with Moloch in the first uh, book of, of uh, Paradise Lost. What makes, what makes evil evil? What makes it wrong? A philosophic question. Do you have to have some kind of standard that is already appropriated from which we deviate to constitute evil and sin. This will be, of course, Milton's game, for lack of a better phrase, his game, allegorical game in the second book. We'll get to it, finally. We want to study this text from its political instantiations. We want to look at, for example, the psychological profile of, for example, a Satan. Follow the notion of being alone as you pick up this volume, okay? And, of course, the societal, the social reading as well. There have, some, uh, there have been some critiquers who have said that the conversation at the beginning of Book 2 of Paradise Lost sounds a whole lot like what happens when you get a bunch of politicians together. For example, those parliamentary debates of the, uh, of the 1640s, for example, which led to all kinds of interesting political turmoil. We, of course, are familiar in our own culture as well today. Any number of nations will say, when you put a bunch of politicians together, it's always a fascinating enterprise. Well, since we're talking about getting a bunch of politicians together, let's turn to it now, and let's go right away now. At level one, remember we work at three levels. Level one, what does the text say? Level two, what does the text mean? Level three, how do I relate to the text at level one? And all we're going to do now is just summarize, and I'm going to spend a little time working with you now through some of the lines. And again, as I did in the last lecture, I like to try to read some of this. I hope that you have your copy of Paradise Lost in front of you, and read along with me so that you can begin to practice. One of the things I will challenge you to do is to read this poetry out loud on your own. I mean this. Try and read this stuff out loud. It will make more sense to you in the long run if you're capable of doing this. We turn now right away to the, to the idea of, and again, I'm not new to any of the stuff that I'm saying. I'm borrowing heavily from Milton scholars who right away when the poem was published were already pointing out some of this stuff. Like, for example, Milton can't be Milton without, we, we mentioned this in the lecture on Areopagitica, that he gave such high marks to Spencer, Edmund Spencer, and his classic text, Fairy Queen. Now, you can, if you want to, go and Google Fairy Queen for yourself, and right away we're going to see that Fairy Queen is an extended allegory. One thing always representing something else. Remember how you can use one text to learn another text our definition of learning. We studied Plato's Republic together and what do we call book seven? You're right, the cave allegory, allegory. One thing representing something else. And right away, the opening lines of the second book will play the game, uh, kind of tipping his hat maybe we would say, to Spencer's allegory of Fairy Queen. High on a throne of royal state, which far outshone the wealth of Ormus or of in or where the gorgeous east with richest hand showers on her king's barbaric gold, pure pearl and gold, Satan exalted set, by merit raised to that bad eminence, and from despair thus high uplifted beyond hope, aspires beyond thus high, insatiate to pursue vain war with heaven, and by success untaught his proud imaginations thus displayed a long set of lines that just simply says, kind of reminding us of, in Fairy Queen, for example, uh, the throne of Lucifera and pride as represented there. In other words, Satan, for your notes, Satan for Milton will be the representation, the allegorical embodiment of pride. Of course, we're going to get to sin and death here in a little bit in a pretty grotesque allegory as well. Now, we'll continue. Satan's speech. Powers and dominions, deities of heaven, for since no deep within or gulf can hold immortal vigor, though opposed and fallen, 
I give not heaven for lost. In other words, we can still fight. Back to the comments of earlier, right? From this descent, celestial virtues rising will appear more glorious and more dread than from no fall, and trust themselves to fear no second fate. Me, though, just right. And the fixed laws of heaven did first create your leader. Pause for a moment, put it in your notes. Satan is going to argue. This is the narcissist speaking. He created himself. It's an amazing rendition of the understanding of alone. I am alone in all ways alone. Wow. We're going to notice the ways in which Satan is alone. To continue, after creating myself, next, free choice. And this will be the first use of the notion of free will, as we have mentioned already. Milton's theodicy answer. The answer to the question of why is there evil in the world is free will, free choice. In other words, God created beings that get, had the right to choose, either to obey or to disobey. Next, free choice. With what besides in counsel or in flight might or have been achieved of merit, yet this loss thus far, last recovered, hath much more established in a safe, unenvied throne, yielded with full consent. The happier state in heaven, which follows dignity, might draw envy from each inferior. But who here will envy whom the highest place exposes foremost to stand against the thunderer's aim, your bulwark, and condemns to greatest share of endless pain? Where there is then no good for which to strive, no strife can grow up there from faction. In other words, dialectic, tension. We think of Hegel, don't we, in his thesis, antithesis, combinations to synthesis. In other words, he says, no, 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 this is great. We have been thrown out of heaven, but we are going to prove that we can overcome this terrible thing. And in the process, our victory will be even more amazing. For none sure will claim in hell precedence, none whose portion is so small a present pain that with ambitious mind will covet more. With this advantage, then, to union and firm faith and firm accord, more than can be in heaven, we now return to claim our just inheritance of old, sure to prosper than prosperity could have assured us, and by what best way, whether of open war or covert guile, we now debate. Who can advise may speak? So it's as if Satan is running the show, and he will say three things. One. We are here, yes, no question. But two, we have a way to make this all meaningful. Number three, let's have a debate. Let's have a discussion because we've got basically two options. He even mentions it. Open war, in other words, we can go back and continue what we obviously lost in the first place, or some kind of covert guile, the idea of deception. We can maybe sneak around and find a way to disrupt what God will have done. Now, we are to the four speeches of book number two. And those four speeches are from the four different God, demon, angels that have been thrown out of heaven. And each one of these four speeches will represent or symbolize a different viewpoint. Okay? So as we go through this really quickly, and I don't have as much time as I wish that I could to go through this, but at least a kind of gesture to it, and to give you a flavor of the language for each one of these. We will begin with Moloch. Now you'll probably remember Moloch, because we mentioned him in our book one discussion. Moloch is the worst imaginable god, because of course he's the god who will challenge the children to go through the fire and sacrifice, child sacrifice and all. He's a bad, he's a bad god. Moloch, right away, will begin. Satan will cease. I'm at line 42 and, and following. And next him, Moloch, sceptered king, stood up. The strongest, the fiercest spirit that fought in heaven, now fiercer by despair. His trust was with the eternal to be deemed equal in strength and rather be less cared not to be at all. And with that care lost, when all his fear of God or hell or worse, he reeked not, and these words thereafter spake. I mean, I'll just pause for a moment. We're going to ask this at the end at level 3A when we make comparisons to other texts. Who, who is your favorite villain in a movie? Who it is obvious 
he or she does not care about dying. Could care If I don't get what I want, I could care less. I'm ready to get jacked right now. That's Moloch. In other words, I lost the battle up in heaven, but the war is not over. And in fact, that's going to be it for your notes. He will simply say, Moloch will say, let's go to war. More war, bloody war. Take a look at how he says it. My sentence, he says it, is for open war. Of, vi of wiles more unexpert I boast not. Then let those contrive who need, or when they need, not now. For while they sit contriving shall the rest, millions that stand in arms, we think immediately, of course, of that well, Milton's poem um, on his blindness, millions uh, stand in wait, and longing wait the signal to ascend, sit lingering here, heaven's fugitives, and for their dwelling place accept this dark, appro uh, appropriate den of shame, the prison of his tyranny who reigns by our delay. No, let us rather choose armed with hell flames and fury all at once o'er heaven's high towers to force relentless way, turning our torches into horrid arms against the torture. In other words, he says, look around you, we got all kinds of fire and brimstone, let's use it, let's go to war. And then he asks it at line 85. He says, what can be worse than to dwell here, driven out from bliss, condemned in this abhorred deep to utter woe, where pain of unextinguishable fire must exercise us without hope of end, the vassals of his anger, where the, when the scourge inexorably and the torturing hour calls us to penance. In other words, he says it, what could be worse? Of course, the obvious question could be answered. Well, a whole lot could be worse, mind you, leading us now to our second speaker, Belel. We're at line 119 with Belel, and Belel, we're told, is uh, an act more graceful and humane. Okay? Um, his idea is going to be, let's wait this out. Hey, hey, hey there's no reason to get all fired up here. Uh, a person fairer uh, a fairer person lost not heaven. He seemed for dignity composed and high exploit, uh, but all was false and hollow. Um, we're, we're, uh, the game here is he's timorous and slothful. In other words, he has a pleasing ear, but Bilal is not going to be about war at all.